for the introduction of the panel, I'm going to turn it over to the moderator, who is Chris Calabrese. And uh, really happy to have Chris here. Chris is actually uh, stepping in because of a family emergency for Laura Moy from the Open Technology Institute at New America. Uh, but we are quite honored to have Chris uh, available to do so. I mean, Chris is the Vice President for Policy at the Center for Democracy and Technology. He's been a lo long time been an advocate for privacy protections, for internet openness, for limits on government surveillance, and for fostering the responsible use of new technologies. Before working at the Center for Democracy and Technology, uh, Chris worked for a very long time at the ACLU. So I'm going to just turn it right over to Chris. And um, this is another uh, panel that's uh, got a lot of information. And uh, hope you guys can stay for it. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Uh, CDT works a lot on two of the three areas that intersect this panel, which are the use of data and on discrimination. We do not work at all, candidly, on competition policy. So I am hoping to be someone who will learn a lot from our panel, and, and maybe I can be a little bit of the voice of the, of the layman. So if I ask stupid questions that you folks already know the answers to, I apologize. I'm going to try to keep them moderately, moderately informed. Um, I'm going to be very quick with our introductions because we don't have a lot of time, and I know you want to hear from them, not me. Uh, I'll introduce folks in the order that they're going to talk. We're going to do uh, five to seven uh, to maybe 10 minutes um, from each of the folks. We'll try to leave some time for chatting um, between us and then for questions from the audience. Um, Jeff Larson, from a reporter for ProPublica. Uh, Ashkan Sultani, technologist and you know, technologist about town and a former FTCer. Um, I'm sorry, actually, we're going to go to Maurice second, but Maurice, law professor at the University of Tennessee and former DOJ. And then at the end, uh, Lisa Gormson, director of the Competition Law Forum at the British Institute for International and Comparative Law. So with that, why don't I turn it over to Jeff? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jeff Larson. I'm the data editor at ProPublica. And um, we're going to switch gears a little bit from Monopoly to talk about um, uh, data analysis and the effect that algorithms have on our daily lives. For the last year, we've been investigating algorithms at ProPublica. <clears throat> and we're particularly interested in the ways in which these algorithms fail. And when these algorithms fail, when they make bad predictions, which groups are affected? I'm going to highlight one. Um, I'm going to highlight one uh, high stakes example of this type of failure. Earlier this month, we published an article called uh, uh, Machine Bias about law enforcement's use of risk scores that try and predict a person's likelihood to commit another crime. So when you're picked up, they give you sort of a test. Um, there are a number of these scores in use around the country, but we focused on an algorithm called Compass created by a company called North Point. We looked at scores that were given to uh, people in Broward County, Florida before their pre-trial release he hearing. So you get picked up. Um, before you go to trial, they figure out if you can go home or how much, uh, how much um, bond you have to pay. Everyone arrested in Broward County is given a test that can contain as many as 137 questions, um, like, uh, like uh, your high school GPA, and whether or not you agree with the statement, a hungry person has a right to steal um, to eat. Um, and North Point, run, North Point software runs these scores through a statistical model called a regression. And that regression spits out a score, low, medium, or high risk, uh, whether or not you have a low, medium, or high risk to commit another crime. We found that these scores are only correct around 60% of the time, so slightly, um, slightly more than um, a coin flip. Um, and when they're trying to predict violent recidivism, they're uh, correct around 20% of the time. In other words, the general recidivism test is wrong 40% of the time. Um, and the violent recidivism test is wrong a staggering 80% of the time. It means only one in five defendants is predicted correctly for their future uh, violent recidivism, um, which obviously is a serious problem 
in a criminal justice context. Now, with any decision you make, there's one way to be right and two ways to be wrong. For example, um, the compass algorithm can only be, be right when it correctly predicts that someone will go back to jail. So within a window of two years, whether or not someone committed another crime. But it can be wrong in two ways. Either it predicts someone as safe and they go on to commit another crime, or uh, troubling, more troublingly in criminal justice, it predicts someone is uh, dangerous and they do not commit another crime. Essentially labeling, labeling someone as guilty when they're innocent, um, before trial. Um, black, and um, it gets worse, black defendants were twice as likely to be in that latter category than white defendants. They were twice as likely to be labeled dangerous and not be um, than they actually are. And it made the opposite w mistake with white defendants. White defendants were twice as likely to be classified as safe and then go on to commit another crime as black defendants. In Broward, black defendants had longer criminal histories and did recidivate at a slightly higher rate than white defendants. Um, so we ran a statistical test to correct for those differences. And black defendants were still 45% more likely to receive a higher score. So even correcting for your criminal history, correcting for your age and your gender, um, if you were an African American, you were gonna get a score that was 45% uh, higher than an average white person, just based on those other questions that you, at, that you answered. One of the 137 questions. Now we don't know what actually goes into this algorithm, the company wouldn't tell us, but we were able to test the outputs to see, um, to see this disparity. One of the people in our story, um, James Ravelli, when we showed him his score, we showed him, we said, you have a low score. And he said, that's very surprising. I just got off of a five-year bid. Um, and after that, I did two more crimes. Um, <laughs> James Ravelli is a white man. <laughs> uh, one other thing that didn't make it into the article, but I do want to share with everybody, um, this algorithm also didn't work across genders. So a high-risk woman was uh, only as risky as a medium-risk man. So again, we're saying people are dangerous when they actually aren't. And I think um, in a global context, testing algorithms this way in the way that they fail is not something that a lot of people do, and it's certainly not something that the company did. They only paid attention to, they actually inflated their score, they only paid attention to the amount of time that it was correct. They, their validations test said it was correct 70% of the time. So it's a very quick overview of our story, kind of a troubling example. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Chuck. I'm gonna turn it over to Maurice now. All right, well, many thanks, Barry, for um, inviting me uh, to this conference. Antitrust law is often tested when it's applied to new industries and new business models. One of the things you always hear is, well, antitrust doesn't really apply, right? Because that applies to the old economy. So one issue is whether or not antitrust is ready in the era of big data and big analytics. And Alan Grinis and I um, are working on several um, projects with the Data Competition Institute. Uh, the first, uh, what I want to talk about is our book, um, Big Data and Competition Policy. Oxford University Press has it already out in the UK. It should be coming out in the US in um, August. And then the second project um, that I'm working on with Ariel Izraki is called Virtual Competition, The Promise and Perils of an Algorithm-Driven Economy. Harvard University Press will publish it this fall. And we had several goals in mind with these uh, projects. The first thing was to understand what is big data, right? What are the four Vs that characterize big data? The volume, variety, velocity, and value of our personal data. The second was to better understand the competitive significance of big data and big analytics, like the algorithm-driven economy, and how that's motivating now companies to obtain a competitive advantage. 
And then the third was to see whether or not market forces will necessarily protect our interests if left alone. And what we find is that there is a disconnect, that we have many more items that are free today online, free items, free services, free apps, and the like. But fewer customers feel in control over their data, and there's an increasing concern over their privacy interests, a hopelessness about being able to protect it. So why isn't privacy competition more robust? And one explanation that we explore involves market power. So right from the beginning, we want to say that big data and big analytics is neither good, bad, nor neutral. It really depends on several factors. It depends on how firms employ these technologies, the firm's incentives relative to our incentives, and then the market characteristics. And big data and big analytics can promote a competitive online environment in which we all benefit, but we cannot always assume that we will always benefit. That some online markets, and that's why we call it virtual competition, may be subject to ordinary free market forces. We may think that we're just ordinary consumers making ordinary purchases that are rather unremarkable, but there's only the illusion of competition. We have no idea the extent to which that we're being exploited. And we can be exploited several ways in this new economy. And the question then is, are antitrust tools ready for it? The first is when computers collude. So as companies are increasingly shifting from humans to self-learning algorithms, there will be new types of collusion that are available. And these types of collusions will be covering industries that weren't susceptible to collusion before and will be much more durable. So the first concern we have is computers colluding. The second is almost perfect behavioral discrimination. And here, firms track you both online and offline. They collect data about you. They develop a profile about you. And then they target you with personalized ads to induce you to buy. And we call it behavioral discrimination because there are two components to it. The first is price discrimination. That's basically algorithms identifying your reservation price, the most that you're willing to pay. But the second component is a behavioral component, is to induce you to buy things that you ordinarily wouldn't have thought you needed in the first thing. So basically getting you to pay more for items that you didn't think you needed. And a third way you could be harmed is what we call a frenemy dynamic. And Senator Warren touched on this in, in her um, lunch speech. And here, frenemies can be firms that have an unusual relationship in that they're both friends and enemies. One Wall Street analyst, I think, said it really nicely, is that apps are worth millions, platforms are worth billions. And who has the power going forward in this big data economy. It's going to be the platforms. And the dominant platforms right now are Google and Apple with their mobile system. And that's going to involve with the Internet of Things and the rise of personal assistance. And here you can see the emergence of a frenemy relationship. The apps and the super platform are friends in that they cooperate in being able to track you, gather data about you, to foster behavioral discrimination. But then they also compete among themselves over who gets the spoils. So if we were to look at this from another perspective, it would be almost as if a den of lions cooperating to how they're going to then corner the gazelle, and then who gets then the choice cut. And it's the super platform, because they have the power, and their power is enhanced. So, the big picture here is our books aren't just about big data and big, big analytics. It's really about some of the weaknesses in antitrust enforcement over the past 35 years. And I just want to touch on a few of them in conclusion. So one weakness, we already heard this through from some of the speakers um, in the previous panel and earlier this morning, is antitrust price-centric analysis. 
The antitrust has developed very good tools to measure the effects of mergers on prices in narrowly defined markets. And so what is measurable has become increasingly important. But things that are important but aren't measurable have been downgraded, such as privacy protection, quality, and even to a certain extent, innovation. And antitrust tools don't work very well when products and services are free because you can't, you know, you can't really ask, well, what would be a small but significant non-transitory increase in price when, when the price is uh, zero? A second concern is the Chicago School of Economics that you heard from Bert Ford, also from Senator Warren. And here it's really the concern over false positives rather than false negatives. There was this belief about self-correcting markets, that many mergers create efficiencies, so we really should have a light touch antitrust. <clears throat> and a third weakness is the basic collapse of our monopolization laws over the past eight years. There haven't really been any cases brought of note over the past eight years. And this is especially problematic, as the last panel brought up, in these data-driven markets where scale and scope and network effects are very important. And what you basically see in these type of markets is that the big get bigger until they dominate the industry. So in conclusion, antitrust has lost its way. We're hearing now from critics on both the right and the left about how industries are more concentrated. The Council of Economic Advisors came out with a report recently um, on economic data with, with respect to that. Two-thirds of Americans now believe that the economy is rigged in favor of vested interests. There's less opportunity for entrance. There's greater concerns of the widening wealth inequality. So antitrust policy has a very important role in our obtaining the benefits of a data-driven economy while mitigating its risk. But the most important thing right now is for the next administration is really intellectual leadership to understand what are these benefits, what are these risks, and how can we refine our antitrust tools in order to address these concerns. Thank you. Great, thanks. Ashka. Thanks for that, and thanks for everyone for coming. Um, I'm not an antitrust guy, I'm a technologist, uh, and I'm primarily focused on privacy and security and data generally. Um, and I have a very naive understanding of, of antitrust law and monopolies. Um, but I understand them somewhat to refer to the exclusive possession or control of the supply or trade in a commodity or service. And I think this is kind of uh, one of the challenges, having you know, previously been at the FTC and really observing um, how we're applying antitrust f thinking to these new markets. Um, I think it's particularly difficult. So, um, you know, the marketplace we're talking about, the digital or online marketplace, often is not exclusively, but most commonly fueled by advertising models, and it's a two-sided market, right? You have advertisers on one side, you have consumers on the other side, and you have firms mediating either access to consumers' eyeballs or their data, or helping, uh, you know, helping sell advertisement to those consumers. And the, the, um, these markets also demonstrate huge network effects where, the as we just heard, the value of the good goes up as more people use the system, both creating opportunities uh, on both sides uh, for natural monopolies um, to, the, to the, the firm's advertising and to having exclusive dominance or access to individuals or consumers. Um, and under the traditional definition, it's hard to say that one firm has a, a monopoly on the data connect collect, right? So about consumers' behavior or about even firms' behavior, particularly because the information or data in this case is non-rivalrous, right? So uh, you can, you know, my having a copy of the data doesn't prevent you from also having a copy of the information, right? And my use of the data doesn't necessarily preclude you from you using, using uh, that resource. And so when you visit a, a news website, you know, so the New York Times or a bookseller, um, that firm does get the, the information about your visit, about uh, individuals' behaviors, but so do any third parties that they contract with to help them provide additional analytics or advertising services, right? So both, both those entities get, um, get that information. And this is mimicked also in the mobile space or the IoT space where, as we heard, there are app platforms and there are even carriers, cellular carriers, and there are, there are um, the apps themselves. And often 
all of those parties may have access to information about people's whereabouts, their locations, their behaviors, and be able to try to monetize them. So traditional antitrust analysis, I think, has a hard time identifying not only what is the resource, but also um, kind of not only what is the market, but also what is the resource. Um, and the concern for me arises that um, certain networks have uh, kind of much higher access, or certain firms have much higher access to the amount of information, the volume of information, the variety of information than other firms, right? Um, my research, this is quite old now from like 2009, identified certain key firms as having 80% of the, the kind of market of users, right? 80% access to, for example, across the top 400,000 websites. Certain firms were prominent across all of those websites, uh, or 80% of those websites, where others were not. And only one or two firms have this vantage point. They provide anal analytics services, they provide um, advertising services, et cetera. And I think that particular um, fact, and, and this research has been followed up by others at Princeton and um, the, the Web Measurement Laboratory. Um, the, so, and it's, it's that exclusive access to that variety and, and, and volume of information that makes that firm's dominance, dominant position unique, right? It's not that, that the information itself is non-rivalrous uh, or that is, re, is, is limited, it's that only certain firms have access to that kind of swath of information. And, and it's, it's particularly important to realize that not all data is also created equally, right? So freshness, uniqueness, sample size is critical for monetizing this information. I might have information about your behaviors from yesterday indicating that you might want some ice cream, but that information will get stale very quickly after you've consumed that good, right? And so it's key to have access, a constant input of this information and access to certain populations that may, other firms may not have access to. Um, and, it, and kind of many of you heard the last point described another way, which uh, the point about scale, which is the, the term of art of big data. And while I think a lot of firms have no idea what they mean when they say big data, and I think most of us may not either, um, it is recognized that to, it's important to recognize that at the scale that uh, actually matters for true transformational insights, um, only few firms have the ability to reach that scale and uh, kind of leverage big data in that way. Um, and that's because often firms are able to bring data, these firms are able to bring data together from a multitude of sources, right? It's not just um, you know, one, one metric or one platform, right? If you ask yourself, for example, how many firms could bring together 80% you know, of the website uh, kind of activity across the web, along with 60% of activity across mobile platforms, in addition to a variety of other things like self-driving cars, um, you know, sensors in the home, so smart cams, there's only a number of firms that can have that vantage point and can actually utilize that information. And I think this is the critical uh, piece, right? Um, and you also have may have heard you know, people make the argument that, well, consumers are free to leave any time. These are, they're not locked into these marketplaces. And I think this is another critical piece to, to understand because, in fact, um, with privacy and with, with information, consumers are the ones that bear the, the for, for example, the harm or the cost of moving across firms, right? So if I give one firm my information and then I leave and then I give another firm my information, I've now doubled my exposure with regards to firms that have my information that could misuse it or breach it or, uh, or sell that information, right? So the actual choice facilitated by consumers is actually kind of a non-choice given that, they, the, that um, they're effectively bearing the cost. And the final quick point I wanna make um, and I think what's the critical point of how we try to address this is that, uh, and it was made earlier, is that we don't really know how to value information in these free markets, in these uh, privacy markets, right? And s many might be aware of the settlement yesterday of my former agency with uh, Volkswagen for $10 billion uh, settling uh, some 500,000 consumers were kind of uh, um, uh, misled about the fuel efficiency of their cars, right? Um, and I kind of want to highlight that, that number in contrast with another case from last week where the agency settled for $4 million um, with, an, with a mobile advertising network that tracked hundreds of millions of consumers' location without permission, right? Uh, and so this is kind of on scale of you know, $10 billion versus $4 million, and this is a smaller firm, but just the number of individuals affected and the sensitivity of information, location information. Um, the, another, similarly, a case that I worked on 
back a long time ago was Google was fined $22.5 million for, um, as a second strike. They were already under uh, a consent order, and they were um, fined $22.5 million for um, misleading consumers about their ability to prevent tracking. Specifically, Google used a method to circumvent privacy protections that consumers had in the Safari browser and continued to track millions of individuals for several months in 2011 and 2012. And in contrast, I just I, I kind of want to show that as an example of how we value these things in contrast to, say, the Volkswagen order or in contrast to the fact that Google made $36.5 billion in 2011. And so how we try to kind of think about the value of that information and the value the firms are able to realize, as well as how we kind of think about um, the value of information with regards to antitrust law, I think is going to be critical in how we solve this. Thanks. Thank you. Lisa? Hello, everybody. Thank you very much to uh, the Capital Forum and New America, especially to Barry for inviting me here today. It is such a relief to be out of the UK. <laughs> I cannot tell you the gloom that's going on these <laughs> days. It's quite horrible. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to get away. Uh, I would also say that I have prepared a number of slides that you should all have seen. I had prepared for a 20-minute spiel that has now been cut down to seven slash five minutes. Well, so uh, <laughs> I'll try to make it short. Um, Barry, he asked me to uh, address antitrust and the intersection with privacy in the EU for US audience. And um, I'm in a panel on discrimination. <laughs> so I will briefly talk about discrimination. So discrimination is relevant when you consider big data, as we have already heard, uh, as it can be used to discriminate consumer groups. And in the EU, that may be considered an abuse of a dominant position. So the relevant framework here is Article 102. I had the pleasure and fortune to spend a couple of days in the UK during the crisis with FTC Commissioner Max Sweeney, who told me that um, that, that the way they use discrimination here in the US is very much to uh, define the market, how you define the market in monopolization cases. But if I go back to uh, uh, antitrust and privacy in Europe for, for quite a long time, we had two parallel discussions going on. Uh, the, the privacy camp would discuss privacy, the competition and antitrust camp would discuss that. But recently, uh, those two camps have come together. Um, and um, Privacy is very much a thing in Europe that's considered under data protection rather than competition law. But that doesn't mean that competition law is irrelevant and they can't do anything in this area. It's just to say that the main aim of antitrust in Europe is not data protection. But uh, of course, in antitrust cases, you can give way to data protection and privacy issues. And you will see, I've mentioned a case in the slide, the SNF case, and that shows that there was an information exchange of private nature going on between competitors. And that didn't mean that the European Commission uh, did not take that case forward. So uh, it, it is still considered something under competition law, despite it being of personal nature. So uh, then the question is um, whether regulators can deal with industries where big data is, is the core of the product market, and the answer to that is yes. So enforcement agencies in Europe, at the very least, has dealt with data for decades. What has changed recently is the four Vs that Maurice mentioned, is that volume, variety, velocity, and value of data has increased enormously over uh, the last couple of years. Um, when we talk about data, data is many things. Data can be an input, it can be an asset, it can be a commodity, and it can also act as a barrier to entry. And I think it's just very important to understand that data can be used differently in different markets. And there is no one size fits all when it comes to data. And one of the debates in Europe, one, not the one, but one of the debates in Europe is um, whether the digital market and online platforms 
where big data includes personal data, uh, whether that requires special regulation, or whether the current analytical framework we have in antitrust can be used for that. My personal view is that we don't need special regulation, but we can deal th that the antitrust framework can easily deal with this. That being said, and this is a big if, that is if the regulators are willing to enforce. So I don't think we need to change the framework. I think we need to change the way we enforce this market. We can't predict the future. What we know is that we can say that consumers still want, whether we're in the offline market, whether we're in the online market, consumers still want lower prices, better quality and choice. That hasn't changed between the offline or the old economy to the new economy, online market. So in the EU, we have had a sector inquiry in the e-commerce market, and the aim of that inquiry was very much to find out whether um, practices from the offline market or the old economy also exist in the digital market? And the answer to that is yes. So going back to the analytical framework, uh, the most obvious provision to use is abuse of a dominant position. And uh, Maurice, he was quite right to say we have the so-called SNP test, which is small, significant, non interest increase in price, and why we, we can't really measure price in this mile, we can measure quality. So the SNP test goes from a SNP test to a SNP with a Q in the end instead of a P, really, because when you look at this, what is so very important is quality and innovation. And then when we look, after we have defined the relevant product market, we uh, need to look at dominance. And what has been mentioned before today many times again and again is scale of data, and network effects. So if you have an industry where there are scale of data and network effects, it can be presumed that these uh, companies that sit on, on, on scale and network effects, that they have a dominant position. And then the question is, what kind of views are we talking about? What kind of uh, conduct are we talking about? Typically in these online markets in the digital economy, it is refusal to supply, it's tying, and it's discrimination. Um, so therefore, I think it's, it's enormously important that in, in enforcement agencies around the world that they focus on market entry and that they make sure that, that big data does not act as a barrier to entry. Um, and if there is no price effect, because price can be very different to measure on the free part of the market, uh, then they need to look to innovation and uh, quality. And of course, everybody knows that the main argument of these companies is that um, against uh, one of the arguments, again, intervention is, of course, that this is a Schumpeterian competition. We don't compete within the market. We compete for the market. And therefore, there is a very natural kind of turnover of companies all the time in these markets. But that's simply not true. I mean, Facebook has been around for a long time. Google has been around for a long time. Amazon has been along, uh, for a long time. Microsoft has been around for a long time. I mean, you get the picture here. There is not such as there is a new social website coming out tomorrow and then the, 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 the year after. Unlike the FTC here in the US, in Europe, we do not have a, an, an agency that can regulate both competition and privacy. Um, so we, we, we don't have co combined authority, but um, that, that said, as I said in the beginning, uh, the privacy people and the competition people are talking more and more together. And as I mentioned, we have Article 102, abuse of a dominant position, and um, uh, what the European Data Protection Supervisor came out with a paper that said that a repeated breach of the privacy rule could be considered an abuse of a dominant position under Article 102. So, to conclude, um, unlike in the US, we do do something in Europe. I mean, we do go after Google, we do go after these big tech companies. So, I mean, it, it, it's not that, that not, nothing in, is happening. And the, the, the Bundeskartellamt, which is the competition authority in Germany and the French competition authority, they have created a joint report on big data. Um, I personally think that was a mistake, not because big data is not 
crucially important. I just think it's very important for an enforcement agency not to be seen as biased. And uh, they didn't consider whether there was a problem in this market. They just said, there is a problem in this market. This is what we're going to do. And I'm not here to advocate, be the advocate for big tech companies. I'm just saying, imagine you go before any of these authorities and, and you are sitting on a big data set. Do you think you're going to get a, uh, a fair treatment or do you think they've made up their mind uh, in, in the first place? Anyway, uh, on that very positive note, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we certainly covered a, a wide terrain here. Um, there's just so many interesting things. Um, you know, I think since since Lisa, you got stuck with a shorter presentation than than I think you you your material certainly deserved. Um, I'm going to direct the first question towards you, and I think maybe wrapping in something that Ashkan mentioned as well, which is how does I mean. Yes, the, the, lot, the argument that you hear from companies is that they are competing f not necessarily between each other but for a market. And, and then your point was, but look at these tech companies. They've been here for a while and they've, they, they tend to stick. But, you know, we also do see new competitors arise. I mean, Snapchat is, is being downloaded at an amazing rate by, by kids today. And maybe the next, you know, platform that has, you know, a potentially dominant position. So... How do we come in, how does this play with Ashkan's argument that data is not a discrete good, but one that you can sort of deliver again and again? So is it possible that we're sort of layering, like, can, you know, essentially layering companies on top of each other where they're becoming collectors of the same data again and again, and all the consumers use Facebook, all the consumers use or a significant portion use Facebook, a significant portion use Google, a significant portion use Amazon, and they're just sort of doling out their data to a, a number of entities. So how does that play into this discussion? If, if a consumer can sort of give away their data again and again, how does that cut when we talk about the, their you know, the inability of new entrants to come into the market or the dominant position and, and, you know, and the harms, I guess, that we see from that? Well, um, it was quite interesting because as when he just said that portability uh, uh, double the exposure. And it's quite interesting because in Europe in 2018, there will be a, a regulation where it, make, it becomes a requirement that every tech company allows portability. And I thought when I read the draft of that regulation that that was a very good thing until I showed up here today and heard, <laughs> no, no, this is not a good thing. This is just double the exposure. So I have to take that home and, and, and think about that a little bit. But uh, uh, to your question, you're absolutely right. The, 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 there are new people coming in. But if you are a small search, search engine and you are competing against Google, how are you going to do that without a big data set? I understand that Uber, they suddenly get in. They had absolutely zero uh, data when they started. And if you ask now, yes, they have created an enormous data set. So yes, there is. And I think it's about finding a new market, creating a new demand that is not already in there. I think in, in, in terms of competing uh, for the market in, instead of within the market, if, if in, in, in terms of competing against Google, I just think you've lost that battle from the beginning. If you're somebody like Uber who starts up in a, in a total different market, th then you can build up your data set from scratch. And, and newer and newer industry do that all the time. And, and Ashkan, I don't know if you want to build a little bit on your, what you see as the harms that come from sort of this wide, widely distributed data sets or widely distributed sort of personal information on each of us. Sure, um, I do think kind of related um, one market to watch, kind of, so we're all trying to predict the future, who knows how it's going to turn out, but I think one discrete market to look at is, it's discrete temporarily, it will be much more broad, but initially uh, autonomous vehicles and later AI generally, right? So you have all of the companies we mentioned, Google, Apple, Uber, um, Tesla, uh, which Moza mentioned, but I think Elon was evoke, invoked. Um, they all are competing for who can build kind of a safe, practical, autonomous vehicle, right? And to do this, it requires incredible engineering, incredible programming and development, but heaps of data, just heaps and heaps of data about um, consumer behavior or driver behavior, road behavior, road conditions, kind of training sets for algorithms to learn on. It's called machine learning. Um, and and 
looking at how these firms that have, for example, incumbent advantages on data, uh, as well as incumbent advantages on data processing as well, right? So if you look at firms like Google, they have historically given away products like, I don't know if people remember Google 411 or Google 511. It was a, a service which was a 411 service. You could call and ask it like directions or um, they were giving that away for free to train their machine learning algorithms to recognize speech, which they now use to do things like show advertising on YouTube videos automatically or, or parse out. But the, the firm, firm's ability to take that take advantage and uh, take advantage of data provided to them versus firm's ability to reap or have access to specific unique types of data. And Tesla in this case, for example, um, since I think 2012, since they, they've been adding sensors to all their vehicles that collect driving habits for safety reasons, but they have real-time telemetry on all of their cars in the field on how people drive them, and they have exclusive access to that piece of information. So one might argue they have a dominance on that piece of information until someone like Uber or something tries to supplant that with mobile apps or Google tries to do with their Street View cars. So I think this is an interesting area to watch about the interplay of data and competitive advantage and AI. It's kind of a hot spot for any sci-fi film, too. Yeah, I mean, this is... So let's <laughs> um, so let's build a little bit on this on this kind of big data machine learning piece and bring in the discrimination aspect a little bit because one thing, of course, we've seen is that machines are are not neutral, right? You have sort of the garbage in, garbage out problem. If you have data sets that have discriminatory inputs, you know, you train machine learning and you can get end up with discriminatory outputs. And I think Jeff, sim you know, and in addition, if you have smaller data sets, which, which is emblematic of data sets around minority populations, they are going to be less accurate because there is less data to train them on, right? So when, Jeff, in your work, I mean, as you were thinking about kind of these inputs, and, and I'm going to turn Maurice to you a little bit to talk about sort of how you see this playing out as you talked about with behavioral discrimination, but what were some of the discriminatory outcomes that you saw from machine learning? And then maybe Maurice can come in and talk a little bit about what that might mean in, in, in this kind of larger marketplace. So, yeah, there's, um, in, in our story, we saw that, uh, you know, a false positive has a uh, unique um, sort of harm, right? You're, you're labeled as more risky um, than you actually are. Which could, which could be, a, you only get tested once. You only get tested for your first arrest. So it literally is a scarlet letter for the rest of um, your life when you have these, uh, when you're tested by these risk scores. But I want to I wanna sort of uh, shift a little bit. This great paper that came out um, uh, last year by a Boston, U I mean, uh, like last week about a Boston University uh, by a Boston University student who looked at these sort of biases in big data. So Google has put on, uh, put out um, uh, artificial intelligence learned data set called word to vec um, and based on data that they own. So they own, they trained this natural language processing algorithm against um, the Google, a Google News data set. And what they found is they found underlying biases. So this algorithm learned it, it basically can learn analogies so he he when you do he doctor and then ask it what the noun is that corresponds to she you get nurse right so they so even in big data sets like this you have those hidden underlying biases that are very hard to correct for that's that that algorithm is now widely used um, for things like autocomplete, uh, you know, it's used for understanding semantic meaning in search results. But it has these underlying biases because it was trained on, unfortunately I'm a journalist, it was trained on the news, and I guess the news <laughs> has some sort of gender things going on in there. But no one's really looking, no one's really asking, right? If we, if we take all of these data silos that are unique to a company and throw them at an algorithm and it spits out something that looks you know, accurate or right. Um, we don't ask whether or not there are these biases or in which way that it fails. And that's, I don't think, by the way, it's just the media that has biases baked in. <laughs> I think it's, it's a little more endemic than that. Um, and then we go to questions or are we done? Oh, okay. Um, Maurice. Yeah, uh, a couple things. I mean, one of the things that we asked was, is perfect price discrimination available 
in our day and age. And that would be the ability of an algorithm to identify for each of you how much you're able to pay. And we spoke with several people in the IT community and they said, no, it's not possible within the next five to 10 years. Um, just given there's so many different problems, including the ability. So what's going to happen is that they're never going to be able to identify how much you are able to pay, but they're going to put you in a group. And in that group, they'll have some idea about what's the, the, the maximum that you're able to pay, like being able to discriminate. And Apple, for example, with your latest iPhone, they promise that they won't segment you in any group smaller than 500 people. But these will be other people who have similar purchasing behavior like you, similar habits and the like. So one of the problems with behavioral discrimination is what if you're put in the wrong group and now you're in a group that might be deemed a bad credit risk or you might be susceptible to some item. So that's one problem. The second problem is the super platform in being able to discriminate has a lot of power and is it just going to be on consumer products but it's also going to be on the news feed. Most people get their news, like younger um, people get their news through Facebook, for example, and some of the other super platforms. And now it's like, what sort of stories are you going to get based on what the algorithm believes you would be interested in? And how could they manipulate your behavior, let's say, before the elections? There's some research with respect to that, to the extent that the super platforms have power to um, influence elections. So you're going to have a couple things going on. One is discrimination based on the category that the company believes you would be best in. The second is going beyond products, elections, and news discrimination. And the news that you see is going to be different from what the news that your, your colleague might see. That's great. So I, too, lied. I thought we had a little more time and we would get a chance to do Q&A. But I'm sorry. That was, that was on me. I, I didn't mean to. Um, what I would like to do, though, really quick, because it's been, a, it's been a, a panel that we've just scratched the surface on, is it would be, I'd love it if our panelists could leave us fairly quickly with just one trend or area that, if, as you consider this over the next, you know, 18 months, that, that you say, boy, I'm going to watch this, because I think it's a really, it'll be very revealing for where some of these issues are going to go. If you could... Each of us kind of give me a, just a, a real quick one just to give the audience something to kind of take away and keep an eye on going forward. Lisa, do you want to start down at the end? Yes, and this built on, on my previous comment, which is conglomerates. While uh, uh, Uber built up its own data set and what they have done is, of course, when they build up that data set, they have expanded from driving around people from town to town to into the food market. So suddenly a company that, that be was a, a taxi company becomes a food company and vice versa. I mean, what happens is these they, they become from a single company to a conglomerate, they expand on one market into the next market into the next market, and that's how they build up, up uh, their market power. So we haven't really been focusing much on conglomerates, and I think that's where our focus needs to be. Thank you. I, um, uh, I'm a little bit cynical, so I think that um, uh, people are going to start noticing that um, artificial intelligence and big data isn't as accurate as it purports to be, and we are starting to see that with... Um, uh, sort of, you know, stories about racial bias and Google search I image results and, and the paper that I mentioned. And I think over the next 18 months, there'll be a lot of soul searching um, over the fact that a lot of these algorithms, the algorithm that I just mentioned, the Google algorithm, is only 40% accurate, right? So what, where are the biases in that? Um, Great. Ashkan? Um, I'm going to leave with a quick kind of thought experiment that touches on these two points, which is that you know, there are intentional biases. Uh, you know, the, the Volkswagen example with, with uh, manipulating uh, emissions was an intentional bias in the algorithm. There's also unintentional biases. And, and the real question that I've always struggled with is how can we know or how can we tell, it's particularly when they're non-public, when the systems are not auditable in a, in a good way. And the thought example that I always use is, you know, we all now use, you know, mapping software like Bing or Google Maps or, or to travel around every day, right? And um, these are now becoming APIs that are the basis in the same way. Search results, all of the other services like Uber and others will use the mapping software. For. And the question that I often ask is, um, we assume them to be the fastest directions from point A to point B based on traffic patterns and distance, et cetera. But as these companies are conglomerates, right? So Google, for example, owns a display ad business for like billboard ads, and they also have retail partners. 
um, would you have any way to know that the directions you're receiving are actually the fastest or quickest, or if they have been kind of slightly manipulated to lead you by a billboard or lead you by a store or lead you by a particular? And I'm not saying it happens. I'm just saying we don't have a way to measure or tell. And I think in these domains, whether it's intentional or unintentional bias, it's quite a precarious place to be. Maurice, you'll get the you'll get the last word. All right. So, the you know where where does the power lie? In 1990s, it was Microsoft with their platform. Mm -hmm. Today, the power lies with the operating system for the two dominant um, mobile platforms, Apple and um, uh, Google. So, where is it going to go tomorrow? And I think this is what one of the themes that you get from our panel. It's the convergence of artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. And what you're going to see is not necessarily new players, but the four dominant super platforms today, uh, Amazon, Google, Apple, and Facebook, they're now investing in that. So the thing to be looking out for, where the power is going to migrate, will be personal assistance. Um, so rather than having a search engine, which makes you do like three iterations, like you have to first search, then find, and then call, you're going to have a personal assistant that's going to guide you, seemingly to your benefit, but there's a lot of power then in what they bring you to. And then the second would be self-driving cars. And not so much as for the technology itself, but really as an advertising-driven platform so that you can then be then subject to or, or benefit from the super platform's other products as well. So that, that's what I would say. Look out on the horizon. Great. Well, please join me in thanking our really excellent panel. Thank you very much.